Max. We are so pleased to welcome you at our office, at the ICJ Tunisia office. Thank you. Yes, I know that this is the first time that you are here in Tunisia. And we are so glad that you would uh, answer to our few questions. So can you tell me, uh, can you talk about uh, why you are here today? I'm here to try and help Tunisian journalists figure out how they should report on the Truth and Dignity Commission. Because I was in charge of television coverage of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission for three years. And we had a very successful uh, program that we ran. And so I thought it would be interesting to compare our experiences and tell them the mistakes we made when we covered the Truth Commission, the pitfalls, the dangers, the potential. And mostly I wanted to tell them that they should be bold and imaginative and that they should realize that the process of a truth commission is more important than any report or any piece of paper than the event. And that only the media can make that happen. They can popularize a truth commission so it affects a nation, the people's, the people's hearts and minds, rather than the politicians and the civil servants. So given that you were writing in Africans, you were writing in large part of those in power or those benefiting from the power. What was it like to publicly confront them with the truth about apartheid and what lessons can you draw from that? Yes, I, I was working with English language newspapers uh, in the 80s. And then towards the mid-80s I realized that most members of the perpetrator class of the white minority government were African speakers, as is my mother tongue. And there is a natural resistance from them to anything that they are told not in their own language, especially if it's done in English. They see that as the enemy. And, and, and I knew I had an obligation to use my mother tongue to speak to my own tribe, to my own culture, my own culture. Which was hard because they don't mind if somebody from us from outside the tribe tells them nasty things. Because they can just dismiss it. But here I am from within and I'm telling them, what are you doing? is wrong. It is a crime against humanity. Do you know what is going on? And I wrote this in Afrikaans, my colleagues and I, uh, in an independent newspaper that we own. And the, the response was very uncomfortable. I became estranged from my family. Nobody from my village or from my family wanted to know me anymore. My father denied that I was his son. Um, so, very traumatic, very, very necessary. Um, to come from within and say it from within instead of criticizing from without. Um, and in the end, I think, despite the fact that we were attacked and harassed and they bombed our office and they tried to kill me and put us in jail and all that kind of stuff. I think it was important to do this in the language, so-called language of the oppressor, so they could never say we did not know. Because we told them what was going on in the black neighborhoods. We told them what was going on in the liberation and so they could never come and say, we voted for the apartheid regime because we didn't know what we told them. So for you, how can media be instrumental in the struggle for accountability and redress? 
For what? For accountability and redress. I think media are ideally placed They're in the forefront of any project to establish accountability and transparency in, in government. Um, because on a daily basis, we can hold up a mirror to government. We can remind them of what they said and what they did and what the reality is. We can, on a daily basis, the media can stir among ordinary people who read and listen and watch television and radio and newspapers and say, this is what these people are doing in your name. You voted for this, so now ask your questions. We will tell you what we think is going wrong, but you, the public, need to, to ask the questions because you have a right to know. So we, as the media, should just be absolutely relentless and do this every day of our lives. Saying the bottom line is politicians and civil servants should be transparent and accountable on every single level. Because that is what democracy is about, not an election every five years. Between elections, media become the most important pillar of democracy. Because you have an election today and you have people elected, they have a free pass for five years before they test the public opinion again. And from that day after that election, the media should step in and say, remember what you promised. And a month and a year in, they should go back to and say, remember what you promised when you asked people to vote for you. That's what the media should do. The media, the media and, and the courts are the two crucial pillars with civil society. When I talk media, I'm media, I talk with media and civil society and the tradition are the crucial pillars of democracy in between elections. So, uh, what was your biggest challenge in covering apartheid and what lessons can be drawn from that experience? I think the biggest challenge uh, during apartheid was, apart from safety, apart from avoiding prosecution, avoiding uh, harassment, avoiding being killed or jailed or tortured, was to penetrate the minds of the people who, believe, who stood behind the regime is the most important, the most difficult thing was to get people to see that the path they were on was leading to civil war and great injustice. It, was, it is very important, it's very difficult for media to demonstrate to a ruling class of people that what they are enjoying is not in their own interest and it is immoral. And they should let go of their privilege because it will lead to revolution, it will lead to civil war if they don't stop. So those those are the difficult, and if you in the media and you are fighting an oppressive system, then you know that you are running certain risks. So that's not the important, most important part. You know that you are putting your life on the line. You know that you run risks to end up in jail or end up dead. That goes without question. The other stuff was far more important, is getting the right information and getting people to believe you getting the ruling class to believe what you're saying and to persuade them. Okay. And, uh, during your first two days uh, with uh, on the training to Tunisian journalists, what questions asked by journalists stood out to you? I think I was interested in, in hearing journalists talk about the different interests that the different media houses represent, the fear among journalists that 
media in Tunisia are representing powerful families, powerful lobby groups, powerful corporations. And not all of them are very happy to see the truth and dignity commission succeed as an open process. I think that was the one thing that was interesting. The other thing that was interesting was the questions that journalists were asking about the Truth and Dignity Commission. Why do you want to limit us so much? Why do you keep on saying, this is not allowed, that is not allowed, this is not allowed, you can't do this, you can't do, give us, give the, uh, reveal the identities of this and that. There's a bit of a suspicion among journalists that they are not trusted and that they should be given more freedom. Um, and also, I was also interested in their interest in my experience that storytelling, putting a human face behind a story is the most effective way to communicate a process like a truth and dignity commission. What should the journalists keep in mind when covering truth-telling activities? They, the media should have respect for victims and survivors, deep, deep respect. And they should show it in the way that they report. The media should Make very sure that they are communicating effectively. If nobody is going to watch a television, if if you don't succeed in getting people to watch it and listen to it, then you have failed. This is not just an ordinary story to be covered by the media. This is a national event. This is a part. This is part of Tunisia's history. It's part of who you are as a people. It is part of who you are as human beings. It is a, it is a big, 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 big moment. And you have to treat, as media, you have to treat this event in that way. And make sure that you tell the stories truthfully that Almost, and this is the other interesting thing that people ask, when I said, are you a citizen first or are you a journalist first? Because normally we say, I'm not a citizen, I'm just a journalist. I'm only interested in the facts. Well, when it comes to Truth and Dignity Commission, maybe you are 50% citizen and 50% journalist. Because this is of national importance to communicate properly. Not anybody's side, but the truth, the people who suffered. What happened? You are writing history. You have to be truthful and you have to be successful in telling the stories so people will listen. And uh, how do you differentiate between or connect activism and journalism? Are they necessarily separate? I, I have always been an activist journalist. Um, I do not believe in object. I believe in fairness and I believe in balance and I believe in checking my sources. I believe in giving the other side a voice but I don't believe in, in this neutrality because it's a lie anyway. Nobody is neutral. You're a product of your environment, your background, your ethnic group, where you grew up, the class you were in your parents, your grandparents, your friends, all those things influence. So, so you have to be honest about all that. When it comes to something like human rights or free speech, how can a journalist not be an activist? Every, every journalist worth his or her salt who is serious about Journalism is an activist for free speech and an open society and human rights. 
That is before you start being a journalist, you have to be those three things. If you don't believe in open society and free speech, why the hell are you a journalist? Why don't you go into advertising? If you don't believe in human rights, what are you doing in journalism? So, no, every journalist should be an activist, but not for sectional interests, not for a political party, but on behalf of the people, on behalf of the greater group, on behalf of fundamental justice, on behalf of openness, on behalf of transparency and accountability. For those things, every journalist should, journalist should be an activist. And if you're not an activist, then I'm afraid I, I don't respect you as part of my profession. Right. So my last question is, uh, what would be your advice for, to the TDC and the Tunisian uh, Truth Commission and for, for uh, Tunisian civil society uh, in order to achieve uh, the, the main uh, TJ objectives, namely the preserving the memory and the history? I would plead with the Truth and Dignity Commission to take the public into their confidence, to trust the people, to trust the media more. I would plead with them to realize that the commission, that this process is not about them. The Truth and Dignity Commission is not about the commissioners or the officials or the politicians or the government or the judges. It is about the people of Tunisia. That's what it's about. And the Commission should always remember that. And the path to a nation, the path to the people, goes through the media. And so I would urge the Truth and Dignity Commission to have a good working relationship with television and radio and, and news print journalists and to help them tell the story, not hinder them. Trust them a little bit more. Because you need to get to the people. This is not about politicians, it's about the masses of the people. Tunisia has a moment now to write history. A unique moment to say, we can, not as one historian or one writer, but as a nation, we can now record our history, what happened before and during this revolution. And that will stand. If you miss this opportunity, it will not come again. It will not come again. So that's where truth is concerned and history is concerned. We are writing history now. Dignity, to me, I'm jealous that South Africa did not call its, its commission a Truth and Dignity Commission. It makes so much more sense than what we have with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So maybe we had a bit of reconciliation. We should have had more dignity. We should have, had, we should have concentrated on human dignity. Because fundamentally, what is behind all the efforts to establish transitional justice and, and, and restorative justice is human dignity. Again, I would urge the Commission and I would urge the media that human dignity has nothing to do with paperwork, with officials, with commissioners, with judges or politicians. We're not talking about their dignity. They have it. They are privileged. We are talking about the dignity of the people of Tunisia. We are talking about the dignity of the victims and the survivors of repression and of the revolution. And I hope and pray that Tunisia will grasp this moment and that 10 and 20 and 50 and 100 years from now people will look around and say, what a grand moment that was in Tunisia's history.
Thank you very much, Tim. Thank you again for your time, and I hope that you enjoy your stay, the rest of your stay here. Thank you for your hospitality. I'm having great fun. Thank you. You're welcome.